Our first group of presenters this afternoon are uh, Bailey Hansel, Hope McDonald, and Emma Peters, and they'll be presenting the work that they've done on the question, is blood flow restriction training as effective as standard strength training for increasing, increasing quadriceps strength in older adults? These researchers were advised by faculty advisor, Dr. Brittany Soda, and uh, uh, were provided with their patient case from Dr. Nick Almond. Thank you, Dr. Shevin. So the normal aging process in surgical operations, such as TKAs, can lead to strength deficits. From ages 50 to 80, individuals lose as much as 30 to 40% of their muscle mass, which is important to note because our patient is in that age range. Patients recovering from a TKA can't safely exercise at higher levels until three to four months postoperatively because the higher intensity can cause harm to the healing tissue and increase patients' post-op pain. Because of this, patients must exercise at lower intensities, which can be ineffective in improving weakness. Prolonged quadricep weakness can lead to compensations, faulty movement patterns, decreased function, and decreased quality of life. It is also the single most important predictor of disability. Low load blood flow restriction training restricts the venous blood flow return throughout the entire exercise, which creates a hypoxic environment so the body recruits muscle fibers, mimicking a higher intensity workload. This increases the hypertrophy signaling cascade and protein synthesis. This allows individuals to increase strength without compounding symptoms or increasing risk to patients with muscular weakness. Our patient is a 64-year-old woman who is three weeks post right total knee arthroplasty, who shows decreased strength in her right lower extremity, especially the quadriceps, where she tested three out of five on MMT following her surgery. She also had deficits in range of motion, mobility, and function. The patient was very active prior to her surgery. So our clinical question is, is blood flow restriction training as effective as standard strength training for increasing quadriceps strength in older adults? Next slide, please. A comprehensive literature review was conducted using databases such as Medline, Cochrane, Sinal, PT Now, Pedro, and TRIP. Additional sources were found through reference scanning. This is an example of a search string we used in Cochrane, which yielded six results. The four bolded articles were praised and used in our clinical decision making. Cook and Meyer was excluded because quadriceps strength was not addressed in the study, and Siegel was excluded because the time frame of the study was four weeks, which is not long enough to show muscle hypertrophy, which takes six to eight weeks and was the outcome of interest. Next slide, please. These are the inclusion and exclusion criteria we applied to all of our articles. And some terms I'd like to operationalize for you are older adults, which we defined as adults over the age of 50, because in our research we found that adults over the age of 50 have a harder time maintaining muscle mass and they'll lose muscle mass faster than their younger counterparts, mainly owing to a decrease in the number and size of type 2 muscle fibers. Low load blood flow restriction training was the intervention of interest, and we define this as the use of an inflatable cuff around the proximal limb to create partial vascular occlusion of at least 50% while a participant exercises at between 20 and 30% of their one rep max. This is compared to standard strength training, which we operationalized as resistance training at between 60 and 80% of an individual's one rep max for two to four sets in eight to 10 reps. Next slide, please. These are the five articles we used to make our clinical decision. The first four are randomized control trials, which had their patients exercise twice a week for 12 weeks, and Baker et al. is our systematic review. Dr. Shevin, if you could click, please. I'd like to bring your attention to the outcomes seen by Cook and LaRoche. The low load blood flow restriction training group saw increases in their leg extension one rep max, leg press one rep max in cross-sectional area of their quadricep during weeks zero to six in their training protocol. However, those gains plateaued after weeks six, while the standard strength training group saw increases throughout the entire 12 weeks of their training program. Next slide, please. So the results from these five studies indicate that blood flow restriction training is safe to use in orthopedic populations, including post-surgical, and is not associated with any increases in knee pain. Blood flow restriction therapy promotes hypertrophy and strength in the quadricep muscle in those with musculoskeletal weakness. Hypertrophy increases at a similar level to standard strength training, and strength increases to a slightly lesser degree when using BFR compared to um, standard strength training. So like mentioned, 
earlier, blood flow therapy, um, the strength gains are typically seen in the first six weeks of implementation, whereas with standard strength training, you observe those strength gains throughout the duration of treatment. Next slide, please. This research has helped guide our clinical decision, which is that blood flow restriction therapy is suitable in the beginning stages of post-operative recovery when heavy loads are not indicated or cannot be tolerated. We believe this patient should be progressed to standard high load training when possible in order to maximize functional recovery and strength gains. However, there are some limitations of this modality. Um, as the other group had mentioned this morning, long-term effects aren't as well known or studied yet because this is a newer modality. Um, there is also the need for a certification in order to perform this safely. And currently there is not a specific billing code for blood flow restriction therapy. So it's likely the therapist will have to bill under therapeutic exercise, which may limit its usage in the clinic. Um, now we want to open the floor to any questions. I'm Dr. Shevin, are there any contraindications to using blood flow restriction therapy with older adults? There were quite a few contraindications that we found. Um, I, I didn't see any specifically with older adults, but as people age, they typically have more comorbidities. So a few of them, um, a few of the uh, contraindications include like hypertension or cardiovascular disease. From Jennifer Bergeron, in your research, did you find any cardiovascular benefits for healthy adults using blood flow restriction for quadricep strengthening? Yes, so we actually found in the literature that the acute and localized increase in blood pressure um, has positive adaptations such as increasing vascular function, increasing peripheral blood circulation, as well as increasing the compliance of arteries and veins. From Ryan, what was the outcome measure that you looked at to measure quadricep strength? So we used a few outcome measures to uh, measure quadricep strength. We looked at um, a leg press one rep max, leg extension one rep max, um, and then maximum voluntary contraction for muscle strength. And then for muscle size, we looked at cross-sectional area via an MRI. From Mel and Allie, because some post-op patients take anticoagulants, do you see this as a risk or a reason to withhold blood flow restriction training initially? So in our clinical recommendation, when working with higher risk populations like those after a total knee replacement, um, we recommend using the Wells Clinical Prediction Rule um, in ruling out a DVT before implementing the blood flow restriction training. From Dr. Barrett, how soon post-op could it be used? And is there any implications to surgical site healing with restricted blood flow? Um, so for the studies that we looked at, most of the articles, um, the exercises, they did included leg press. So we'd want to make sure that the patient has enough flexion to be able to safely do that. And in terms of the surgical hardware, um, the literature didn't show any evidence of damage. Um, case reports that we looked at by Gonder, Shelley, and Tennant, um, they had post-op patients and there was no harm to any of the surgical structures. And then we also spoke to a total joint surgeon and they said they didn't have any concerns with the hardware or the implant because those are cemented in. Additionally, the placement of the cuff is proximally to the limb, so it wouldn't be near the knee joint anyways. Great. From Dr. Campbell, were your studies limited to lower extremity? Yes, um, we were looking at the quadriceps specifically, so we ruled out um, any studies that used uh, upper extremity blood flow restriction. From Izzy, with this surgical intervention, are there any risks to surgical future? Um, so this might need to be discussed with the specific surgeon on a case-by-case -case basis, as the largest concern would be blood flow to the scar, um, as well as the effusion to help heal the wound itself. But in the case of our patient, the MD was aware and recommended this treatment. Any other questions? From Dr. Brooks, the patient was noted to be very active as an older adult. Does the level of prior activity impact the possible outcomes considering the research may be oriented 
toward the younger athlete. The activity level of our patient was one of the reasons that we wanted to explore the use of the blood flow restriction training because it is used so much in younger athletes to return to function. Um, so that really did inspire our question, yes. We also um, made it part of our exclusion criteria that the um, researchers needed to not include a period of inactivity to better suit our patient. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, if we could get the next set of researchers to unmute. So our next presentation, uh, our next researchers are Joshua Capello, Kelsey Kremenek, and Allison Skinner who are presenting their research question in an ambulatory physical therapy clinic, what tool is both valid and most efficient to screen for pain catastrophizing among adults with chronic musculoskeletal symptoms? Their faculty advisor was Dr. Julia Shevin and their reader was Dr. Monica Stefanovic. Thank you, Dr. Shevin, if you click one more time. The patient case that we looked at was a 44 year old, active, healthy male, who presented to outpatient physical therapy for deep right hip pain. Upon initial evaluation, the physical therapist screened for red flags, all of which came back negative. What's interesting about this case is that although the physical therapist did not identify any red flags, the patient had a fear that his pain was attributed to cancer, and he held this fear throughout all of his treatment sessions. He had a plateau in progress during his sixth session and experienced increased pain severity. The physical therapist suspected psychosocial factors were involved with this plateau, and our background research led us to believe that the patient was a pain catastrophizer. Please click. Pain catastrophizing is a modifiable risk factor characterized by the domains of rumination, magnification, and helplessness. This exaggerated negative mental state can occur when a person deals with a painful event and can lead to increased pain-related disability and poor outcomes in physical therapy. When working with a patient who is a catastrophizer, a multidisciplinary approach involving psychologically informed physical therapy and potential referral to cognitive behavioral therapy is the best way to optimize patient care and improve pain-related outcomes. Next slide, please. The purpose of our manuscript was to determine the most valid and efficient assessment tool that screens for pain catastrophizing in adults with chronic musculoskeletal pain. Since the patient presented to an outpatient physical therapy clinic, we decided to keep our focus in this setting. Although we know that care is not linear, we will be presenting it in this manner to highlight the importance of our clinical question. As I mentioned in the previous slide, Current literature on pain catastrophizing consistently demonstrates a negative association between catastrophizing and clinical pain-related outcomes. In order to improve our level of care for chronic pain patients, it is important that we are able to identify this pain construct early on in the episode of care. This will allow us to implement a multidisciplinary approach and improve pain outcomes in our patients. In order to do this, we need to have the right tool that will help us to identify the three domains of pain catastrophizing in an efficient manner. Next slide, please. For our searches, we utilize Medline, PsycInfo, CINAHL, PubMed, and Google Scholar. The peer review limiter was applied to find specific, relevant, and high quality articles. However, due to limited research on psychosocial assessment tools in physical therapy, we chose not to limit the study type or level of evidence selected. Articles were included if the subjects had chronic musculoskeletal pain lasting three months or more and were working aged adults, which we defined as 18 to 64 years old. Articles were excluded if the recruited participants had mental health conditions, used opioids, had work-related injury, or were undergoing pre- or post-operative care, as any of these factors can influence catastrophic thinking and were not applicable to our patient case. Likewise, we excluded research conducted in an inpatient setting, as this setting did not apply to our clinical question. Articles that met these criteria can be found in our flowchart, with the search string that led us to each. Additional articles were found via reference scanning the selected articles that we had appraised and annotated previously. Next slide, please. Nine articles were used in our final clinical decision and 10 screening tools were assessed for construct validity regarding pain catastrophizing. We used an evidence-based approach to answer our question as well as expert opinion to further strengthen our decision. To see how often these screening tools are being used in current and ongoing research, we searched the clinical trials registry. Among the screening tools, the PCS is being used most frequently with over 500 trials referencing this tool. 
The CSQ is the second most used. However, it is only being used in 76 trials currently. A modified Delphi study by Schleicher, Coerce, et al. addressed the acceptability of the PCS, PSEQ, CSQ, and CSQR. This Delphi study was included in our research because it provided us with an expert opinion regarding some of the various tools included in our research. The PCS, PSEQ, and CSQR were all considered acceptable to the experts in this study. It was this expert opinion combined with our evidence-based research that led us to our clinical decision. Next slide, please. Based on our research, we concluded that the PCS4 is the most valid and efficient tool to identify pain catastrophizing in an ambulatory clinic. Other tools analyzed either had too many items to be considered as the most efficient or were not able to capture all three domains of the pain catastrophizing construct. The chart is an abbreviated version of the questionnaires analyzed for our clinical decision. For the full chart, please refer back to our poster. The PCS4 is a free tool that identifies all domains of pain catastrophizing. The original PCS and the PCS4 both meet the criterion for construct validity and have significant correlation to one another of 0.96. However, the PCS contains 13 items, where the PCS4 has four items, making it more efficient, which led us to select the short form over the original. Next slide, please. When pain catastrophizing is properly identified early on in an episode of care, it can allow the physical therapist to incorporate education on pain experiences pain science, and the benefits of cognitive behavioral therapy. If it is not identified, it can lead to poor pain outcomes, an increase in pain-related disability, and, incre and even increased levels of anxiety and depression in your patient. Providing psychologically informed physical therapy is an important aspect of care for a patient with this modifiable risk factor. The PCS4 would help to identify this risk factor and help to inform an individualized plan of care for that specific patient. The items used in the PCS can be found also on our poster. At this time, we'd like to thank and acknowledge Dr. Julia Shevin and Dr. Monica Stefanowitz for their help and encouragement throughout this process, and we are indebted to the patient for the inspiration of this research effort. We would like to take any questions you may have. Thank you. The first question from Dr. Shevin. Your work is based on the empirical literature in a Delphi study that ascertained what therapist felt was appropriate. How would you determine what a patient felt was most important in terms of a screening tool? So the PCS4 has, like Ali said, four questions, and that covers each of the three domains of pain catastrophizing. So if we noticed that perhaps the patient had more of a focus on rumination, magnification, or helplessness, we could then use the um, original PCS to take a look at more of which of those domains the patient was more affected by, and that could help steer our treatment and our possible referral to a cognitive behavioral therapist. Yeah, and additionally, um, from a patient's perspective, I know when you're first coming into a physical therapy clinic, um, you're gonna be kind of bombarded with a lot of different um, outcome measures and questionnaires to fill. And so we really wanted to try to find a tool that was gonna be the least impact for both the therapist, but also for the patient. So we really wanted to find that tool with the least amount of questions so that I wasn't as much of a hassle for them as well. Great question from Ryan. I think you mentioned you excluded mental illness from the searches. Does that mean anxiety was excluded too? Do you think this might be an issue with someone who is a pain catastrophizer? So there, we did exclude um, patients that were recruited for solely having mental health conditions. Um, there is a lot of research out in, in the field about patients that do have anxiety and depression and a variety of other mental health conditions. And they are more likely just because of the nature of that mental illness to pain catastrophize. So because this patient specifically did not have a diagnosis of anything mental illness related, we wanted to exclude that to match our patient. But there is, like I said, a very wide variety of research surrounding mental illness and pain catastrophizing. Question from Abby Doherty, is pain catastrophizing prevalent in patients with chronic pain? Would you use this screening on all patients with chronic pain? Yeah, so our research focused on chronic muscular skeletal pain in general. So we would advise using this um, in an outpatient clinic to any patient with chronic muscular skeletal pain, as long as they didn't have um, any of our exclusion criteria um, that we mentioned before, such as mental illness. 
Question from Marissa. How has a PT, will you use this information to guide your practice if you determine your patient does pain catastrophize? So I, oh, go ahead, Josh. <laughs> I think like we mentioned earlier, we really want to, if a person does come to us and we identify them as being a pain catastrophizer, we really want to refer them to a multidisciplinary approach. So either providing like that psychologically informed physical therapy practice like we talked about, or potentially referring out to cognitive behavioral therapy, mainly because we know that there's a lot of negative impacts that, you know, being a pain catastrophizer, pain catastrophizer can have on um, pain outcomes. So we really want to be able to optimize the level of care for the patient. So we either, you know, combining you know, our normal standard physical therapy practice with these psychologically kind of informed um, principles. And in addition to that, it'd be most important as we begin to enter the clinic, we'd ideally love to see this implemented on an initial eval, especially if there is, like we were saying before, a history of mental illness or a mental health condition diagnoses, as that puts them at more of a risk to be a pain catastrophizer. So this is something that you could use anytime in a plan of care, but you would ideally like to use it right off the bat so you can ensure they're getting the best care possible. Question from Dr. Campbell. Given how few questions needed to assess, do you feel it is, well, let me turn on. Do you feel it is the actual questions that were the most critical or does it seem that the most important factor is that PT do any assessment of this, i.e. the framework of PT should be to be aware of pain catastrophizing and help patients? I think it's very important to screen for this in patients. Um, the questions did address all three domains of the pain catastrophizing construct. So it does identify and you can tell which domain they're more um, leaning towards. Um, but I do believe that providing the psychologically informed physical therapy would be a benefit of using these assessment tools and just being aware of the psychosocial factors that may be applicable to your patient. Question from Jen Bergeron. What would you say the biggest barriers for implementing these screening tools into regular PT practice are? So I think a lot of that is time related. Um, and that was part of the reason why we did this because our reader works at a very busy clinic. This is something that needs to be able to be done quickly. So that's why we went for those four questions. There is actually current research being done on a daily PCS, which is it's something that can be done online. Um, so in the future, that's something we'd like to see, like if this were able to be done prior to the patient coming in for their initial eval. But because it is so few questions, it's something that can be done very quickly. I think another barrier is that it's not very well known. It's um, on the newer side, the PCS is predominantly known. Um, so getting that information out there that there is a short form that correlates highly to the original would be beneficial. Question from Mel and Allie. Once you have identified your patient is a patient catastrophizer, what are some strategies you, you can implement in the scope of practice to help progress the patient through treatment? So we talked about a little bit about pain science and educating the patient on pain experience. This is important to let your patient know and talk to them about the pain they're feeling, that it's real, and that it comes from all over. It's not just that specific site that they're feeling and that their pain is valid. Um, so just educating them on pain science. Um, and if it is a little bit farther and they are a pain catastrophizer, you can refer them if you do feel like um, they need this multidisciplinary approach that could potentially benefit them. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. <laughs> I would like to invite the next presenters to unmute, please. Our next three presenters, hopefully you have muted, are Elena Murphy, Jeffrey Hulse, and Olivia Seeley. And they'll be presenting on the research question, for patients in the ICU on mechanical ventilation, which outcome measure has the best clinometric properties for measuring physical function? Their uh, faculty advisor is Dr. Angela Campbell, and their reader is Dr. James Cody. So a little bit of background on our question. Uh, medical advancements in critical care and the use of life support technologies has increased survivorship in the ICU setting. 
As a result of this, ICU survivors have had a decreased quality of life and function after discharge. Up to 80% <coughs> of ICU survivors have not returned to work five years after discharge due to the residual effects that they experience. ICU acquired weakness and what's known as post-intensive care syndrome are not the same as typical disuse atrophy experienced by patients after a hospital stay. ICU acquired weakness can result in rapid depletion of as much as 20% muscle mass within the first 10 days of ICU admission. Post-intensive care syndrome can result in physical, emotional, and mental symptoms that continue to persist even after a patient is discharged from the ICU. This can include PTSD, anxiety, depression, and they often are unable to complete their instrumental ADLs when they return home. Next slide, please. The patient who inspired our research question was a 51-year-old male who presented to the emergency department with symptoms of a COPD exacerbation. He was placed in the ICU on a mechanical ventilator after treatment. After sifting through many questions surrounding the patient and with the guidance of our advisor and reader, we decided the ICU setting was the most important part of our patient case because that seemed to be where there was a gap between current physical therapy practice and evidence-based support. The purpose of our research was to find the evidence supporting outcome measures in the ICU and come to a conclusion regarding the best measure. With more and more ICU patients surviving, this is becoming more relevant to track changes in physical function throughout the ICU stay and after discharge instead of just survivorship. Next slide, please. To begin our search, we accessed the Medline Complete and CIMEL databases via the EBSCO host database through Springfield College and Google Scholar and PubMed through their public access websites. Our initial searches used the keywords pictured here on the slide, and we compared the articles, titles, and abstracts against our inclusion and exclusion criteria also pictured here. After combining these keywords into search strings in different combinations, our final search string was run on a monthly basis through the EBSCO host database from October of 2019 through July of 2020. All articles found to meet our inclusion and exclusion criteria were appraised using the appraisal forms adapted from the Juul text by two individual authors, leaving the third author to settle any discrepancies. Next slide, please. After a thorough review of the literature, we found six articles that compared six different outcome measures used in the ICU for patients with cardiopulmonary pathologies and their psychometric properties. The six outcome measures found were the physical function ICU test, or the PFID, the functional status score for the intensive care unit, or the FSSICU, the Chelsea Critical Care Physical Assessment Tool, or the CPEX, the ICU Mobility Scale, or IMS, the Short Physical Performance Battery, or SPPB, and the Perme Mobility Scale. The Perme Mobility Scale has a lot of promise in clinical applicability due to the fact that it accounts for lines, leads, and ventilatory support, but it is currently lacking in psychometric property testing. The SPPB has strong evidence to support its utility, but there is too high of a floor effect in the ICU setting. The IMS is only a sliding scale from 0 to 10, with 10 indicating independent mobility. This tool also has too high of a floor effect to be an effective measure in this setting. Next slide, please. In deciding which outcome measure was most supported by the evidence and would accurately assess the physical function of our patient, we decided to use a pros and cons list. The top three outcome measures were the FSS ICU, the PFITS, and the CPACs. These had the best clinometric properties and were mentioned in most of the articles we found. When considering which measure is best, we considered not only reliability and validity, but also one that fits into the existing clinical framework of the ICU setting. We chose the CPACs because most of the elements of the test are already part of a typical PT exam and gave a score that can be used to objectively track change in patient function over time. The FSS ICU and the PFITS were ruled out because we felt that it did not account for barriers to mobility that are often present in the ICU and would not accurately measure function in extremely low functioning patients as well as the CPACs did. Next slide, please. So our clinical decision and conclusion is that the CPACs is the most appropriate measure of function for our patient case. It has a low floor effect to capture lower level patients without missing daily subtle changes and a high enough ceiling effect to get close to full function. 
In other words, it will continue to collect changes as the patient becomes more independent and returns to a higher level of functioning. All but one of the components demonstrated in this graphic here are included in a typical PT-ICU evaluation. Therefore, the addition of this outcome measure should only add about two minutes to assess grip strength. Implementing outcome measures such as this can show PT effectiveness with early mobility and treatments in the ICU setting. This diagram representing the CPAC score can be posted on the patient wall, allowing easy interpretation by other healthcare professionals caring for the patient as well as friends and families to see how the patient's function is progressing over time. And now we are opening the floor to any questions. Question from Mel and Allie. Can these tools be used across disciplines, i.e. nursing care? How does this affect how often outcomes are and should or should be measured? So that was one of the areas we wanted to look at. So that's why we also assessed the ceiling effect. Um, there wasn't research that looked across different measure, measures. However, with a high ceiling effect, you can look to at patients close to independent in the um, functional parts assessed. So um, we recommended more research looking and following these patients through to final discharge and discharge home. Question from Danielle Levine. What clinometric properties did your group feel were most important when creating your pro and con list and determining which outcome measure was the best? So due to the, um, the fluctuating status of patients in the ICU, we thought that it would be rather important to focus on responsiveness, um, just because subtle changes can indicate different um, things going on medically. So we really wanted to focus on the MCID and the floor and ceiling effects um, so we can track how well the intervention is uh, improving their mobility and then uh, the low floor and ceiling effects so we can get them at their lowest level of function as well as track them through their stay to get up to their uh, highest level of function as well. Question from Allie Skinner. What type of validity was identified for the CPACs? CPAX was found to have good, uh, good construct validity, measuring like all of the um, aspects of physical function, as well as um, uh, Corner et al. in 2014 found that it was um, good construct validity as well to aid in discharge placement. Question from Dr. Shevin. There are many reasons to use outcomes, outcome measures, including predictive validity. Does this tool predict later function or later outcomes or discharge destination? So there's been some new research on how the CPACs will be able to predict discharge destination. Um, we were looking at a PowerPoint by Thomas Bond, who is a current physical therapist, um, and he was looking at how the CPACs can help to predict if the patient needs to go to a hospital setting, to a skilled nursing facility, um, or can be discharged home after they get to the hospital. So it's, it's new. There's not that much research behind it yet, but they are looking into that. From Ashley Gallo, why is grip strength included in the CPACs? What is the importance of this measure? So the single measure of grip strength, actually there has been research behind it that shows correlation to total body strength. Um, and it actually has shown predictive validity for recovery and mortality rates as well. From Jennifer Bergeron, being that the CPACs includes mostly components of a typical exam, why do you think it's not used more frequently? Um, so we believe that it's not used more frequently because it is fairly new. It was developed in England, so it is actually used quite a bit in the UK. Um, it just hasn't reached the US as quickly. Um, and also just overall use of outcome measures in the ICU is very limited. Um, partly due to the medical complexities of the patient, there's a lot of focus on getting them to survive, but now that more are surviving, it's important to focus on their physical function after they leave. Question from Haley Serpa. Are all the outcomes that you recommended currently being used in PT practice? If not, how can all these outcomes be implemented? So they, 
some of them are currently being used in PT practice, but some have actually just been created. So the Permian Mobility Scale, for example, it has just been created. The first article um, being published about it actually hasn't even come out yet. So that just goes to show how new all of this is. Um, but the PFID, the FSS, ICU are currently being used in the ICU setting, but it's just a matter of how often they're using it, which typically isn't that often. And I think that has a lot to do with like the education piece and showing that patients, patient preference, they really should be worried about how they're going to be able to function long term. Um, so the physical therapists just need to be educated on how these outcome measures could help them in this setting. Just to clarify, um, so we did have an article on the permeable mobility scale regarding the clinometric properties, but they were done by um, Dr. Perme. So um, there was a little bit of question. Um, so we had one article, but it was done by her. So there just needs to be more research regarding that outcome measure. Great. I think Marissa's question was answered in there. So I'll move on to Mel and Allie. Do you think based on the recent surge of patients in the ICU due to COVID um, will result in an increased use of these tools? So this is obviously um, something that we've talked about a lot because we actually started this project with this question prior to COVID. Um, and now we feel that it's even more applicable to the ICU setting um, because physical therapists are going to be there um, tracking their function as they're healing from being on mechanical ventilation, a lot of patients. So I think um, this is an even more prominent topic, and I hope that that influences people to start utilizing outcome measures in the ICU setting. Great. Any more questions? Thank you very much. We'll move to our final presentation of the day. Uh, if the next presenters could unmute themselves. Our final presentation for the DPT class of 2021 research projects will be uh, done by Jennifer Bergeron, Benjamin Gatlin, and Danielle Levine. And they are addressing the question, in older women, does respiratory muscle training improve functional mobility? Their faculty advisor is Dr. Angela Campbell, and their reader is Dr. Abby Fagerholm. Thank you, Dr. Shevin. As healthy adults age, it's normal to see a reduction in respiratory muscle mass, strength, and power as the result of sarcopenia. A decrease in chest wall compliance can result in limitations of airflow, increased air trapping, and an increase in residual volume. Increased spinal kyphosis may also cause a decrease in the ability of the diaphragm to expand, resulting in a decreased lung capacity and inspiratory flow. Poor respiratory muscle function can lead to a reduced exercise capacity and physical activity in older adults. Inspiratory muscle training has been used in studies to increase costal expansion and improve pulmonary function. It has been studied and validated most commonly in adults with COPD and in the Parkinson's population. There have also been studies looking at the effectiveness of respiratory muscle training in patients with low back pain. Clinically significant increases in respiratory muscle strength improves an, an individual's ability to take slow, deep breaths when engaging in physical activities. Our patient is a 94-year-old woman presenting to outpatient PT with stenotic low back pain. She has a significant but flexible kyphosis of her thoracic spine. A gross motor screening revealed impaired costal expansion, and she reports discomfort upon increased exertion and postural demands. Her PT treatment included diaphragmatic breathing, postural exercises, lumbar pelvic stabilization exercises, spinal mobilizations, and general lower extremity strengthening exercises. We set out to answer the question, in older women, does respiratory muscle training improve functional mobility? Next slide, please. A systematic review was performed searching electronic databases, including PubMed, CINAHL, Pedro, and Cochrane from October 2019 until July 2020. Our search terms included older women, older adults, seniors, elderly, geriatric, respiratory training, breath training, inspiratory training, expiratory training, resisted breathing, and breathing exercises. We limited our results to English only. We applied our inclusion and exclusion criteria to the articles that we came across. The most common outcome measures throughout our research were the six minute walk test, the tug, and the five times sit to stand. Next slide, please. This is a figure of our search process. 
We conducted our searches on PubMed, Sinal, Pedro, and Cochrane, as Danny just talked about. We initially came up with an extensive list of search results. After scanning titles and abstracts using our inclusion and exclusion criteria and excluding duplicate articles, we narrowed our search down significantly. After reviewing 14 articles for quality, we ended up with our final six. Um, our quality review process included um, having the articles reviewed by two of our group members, and we used the appraisal tool from the Jewel text. Any disagreements were settled by the third group member. If you look to the right of our slide, this is our final list of articles. Next slide, please. So this slide is a breakdown of the study interventions and results from our six articles. You can see that slightly different parameters were used for intervention in each study. On this chart, we have only listed outcomes from the studies that measured what we defined as functional mobility. So although the studies had additional primary outcomes that they focused on, we were most interested in analyzing these particular results. The results that are in green were both clinically and statistically significant. The results in yellow were not clinically significant either because the outcome had no defined MCID available or the outcome didn't meet the MCID threshold. However, the yellow results were found to be statistically significant. The study that's highlighted in red was not found to be clinically or statistically significant. So we worked to see if there was any correlation between parameters, study quality, and the outcomes measured along with the study results in order to come up with our clinical recommendation. Next slide, please. Majority of the research supports the use of IMT in not only improving respiratory function, but also functional mobility. Multiple studies not only reach levels of statistical significance, but also levels of clinically meaningful change. In addition, it appears that resistance is an important factor in introducing these changes. This is consistent with overload principles of strength training. It's important to acknowledge limitations of our review as this impacts clinical decision making. Our two biggest limitations were overall low quality of studies used and heterogeneity of the study designs, specifically the outcomes used. Next slide, please. In terms of how the research affects clinical practice, we suggest that IMT be considered as part of an adjunct intervention, especially in patients that are low level, not first line treatment. It's important to remember the role that improving thoracic mobility and general strengthening and conditioning exercises may have in treating a patient like the one we present. Reasons to consider IMT are the research presented, biologic plausibility, as well as minimal to no adverse side effects, which is an important consideration for any intervention. Practically, IMT can be included as part of a home exercise program which the research supports. Most research sent patients home with a threshold device and there were good rates of adherence. In regard to a protocol, the most commonly used one was two sets of 30 breaths done daily at 50% of maximal inspiratory pressure. It's important to take into account time considerations as well as patient characteristics. For instance, some protocols focus on endurance with bouts of 30 minutes daily, which might not be practical for most individuals. 50% of MIP is a middle value between endurance and strengthening and may be a good starting place for most patients. Of course, clinicians can increase resistance as the patient progresses. For these reasons, IMT may be a useful intervention to improve function in older adults. I'll now open the floor to any questions you may have. Great. From Mel and Allie, has patients age and dementias become more common? How do you think this may impact the success of this intervention? Do you have any strategies that may help clinicians to overcome these barriers to adherence? Although this wasn't an area that we had um, incorporated in our research, um, I think that as clinicians, we might consider um, ways to promote like teach back to get the patients to think more about the intervention um, and making sure that they truly understand it. Of course, this is really going to rely or depend a lot on the severity of the patient's level of dementia. Um, it might be that they're unable to remember to do this intervention at home on their own time. Um, so maybe you could try to incorporate some family education so that way there are other people to provide guidance and to help maybe remind them to perform the intervention as it was most effective when they were performing it either daily or five times a week. So. I think most importantly, you might have to rely on other people to help them to remember. Great, from Bailey Hansel. What was the rationale for focusing primarily inspiratory muscle training rather than other aspects of respiratory muscle training? So I think 
two parts to this. One, most of the literature focused on inspiratory muscle training, and that's just kind of what drives us to look at that. Second, though, um, if we take a look at, um, especially with our patient case, kind of like the kyphotic posture, um, inspiration is a more difficult act than expiration, so um, it makes sense to focus on that as part of our intervention. In addition to what Ben had just said, um, there was some additional literature that we had reviewed and not incorporated uh, within our final list. Um, there was some literature that had um, looked at patients using like um, a pinwheel and using like forced expiration. Um, and then there were other studies that looked at using musical instruments and playing musical instruments for a period of time, either daily or every so often. Um, and there were found to be some benefits to doing these interventions as well. However, for the sake of um, trying to keep our study as homogeneous as possible with the studies that we looked at, we decided to focus mostly on resistive inspiratory muscle training. From Dr. Shevin, in the articles you reviewed, did the participants have many comorbidities? Is there a case to be made for doing IMT for all older adults who come to PT clinics with musculoskeletal conditions? At what age would you start doing this for patients with um, musculoskeletal conditions? So in the article that we reviewed, we did exclude any um, patients with comorbidities such as like lung cancer, COPD, or anything like that because we really wanted to focus on the musculoskeletal aspect of it rather than the pulmonary aspect of it. Um, so there could be a case to be made for um, individuals that come in that have a harder time doing functional activities due to being more out of breath, easier um, and I think it's more of the reason that they're not able to do the functional activity. So if it's because of knee pain, it would be wise to focus on the knee pain and then potentially doing some um, IMT or respiratory muscle training after that, if that is a reason for them not being able to complete their functional activities. In addition to what Danny said as well, um, although we didn't focus on literature where um, the populations were affected by comorbidities, especially pulmonary comorbidities. There is a substantial amount of literature out there that does support the use of respiratory muscle training and inspiratory muscle training for patients with uh, conditions like COPD or other obstructive diseases. Um, we also did find a, a limited amount of research that showed that there was benefit for patients with restrictive diseases. Um, but in general, I think any patient with any kind of movement limitation, um, no matter what the comorbidity might be, it could potentially be a beneficial adjunctive treatment because you're getting some benefits without actually having to physically move. From Dr. Kaufman, I understand that you focused on a six minute walk test, the tug, and the time um, sit to stand. Has your proxies for function and then you're not reporting here on other, other measures. I'm curious about whether there were other activity oriented measures or other than standing or walking that appear to respond to IMT. Something that one study reported was, um, I believe, it was the mini best as an outcome measure that actually did reach um, the MCID, which um, I found surprising because to me it makes sense that you know six minute walk tests would improve. Um, and I think the rationale for that that the authors explained was um, that breathing and posture and um, core activation are kind of interrelated. Um, so you know, that was one measure that um, isn't what you were, you were listing. Um, and then they also looked at things like, you know, abdominal strength, um, you know, it was a important measure for some studies as well. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. That was a great presentation and uh, that wraps up all of our, uh, sorry, all of the presentations for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the afternoon. Um, I know for sure that the faculty would like to congratulate you on your, on your amazing effort and on the work that you've done. Uh, it's kind of, as you know, been a tricky and long road. And what we're hoping is that um, we're going to be able to come back to this. So we really hope that we're going to return to the ideas you presented today at a later date and that you're going to go out into the clinic thinking about blood flow resistance training, uh, the use of clinical tools, 
exercise or running, breathing and respiratory muscle training, which were all themes of the day, not necessarily advising you to do respiratory muscle training with the blood flow resistance training on that part of the body. But it was a pretty remarkable day of presentations. And so what we're asking you to do is as you go out to clinic, please reflect on your research, reflect on your conclusions, reflect on the conclusions you heard from your colleagues. And then we're going to probably be asking you about this before you complete the program uh, looking to May of 2021. In the meantime, what I think we're all want to say to you is congratulations for, for really nice work and a job well done on these research projects. It's been a long time since March. I'm not sure how many of you remember this, but I did take this picture uh, just before we left uh, Springfield College, and I still look at it every so often to remind myself of what you guys look like in the classroom. We all believe that you're ready. Uh, we all believe that you're capable. We wish you your best on your clinical experiences, and now's the time to celebrate. Congratulations, and thank you for everyone for being a part of, of, of the research presentations today. So this concludes our research presentations for DPT 2021. Thank you.